Okay, in this video, we're going to be talking about the worst, most dangerous chemicals for thyroid function and hypothyroidism. So kind of buckle in. It's a long list. Got a lot of different little chemical names, but I'll make it all make sense for you. So stick with me. All right, so in this video, we're going to be talking about a paper that was done a little while ago that looked at something called neo antigens and how those get formed and can they affect thyroid function. All right, so just remember the way th your thyroid works is you've got your pituitary gland that makes thyroid stimulating hormone and then there are little receptors for that on the thyroid gland and that then makes the thyroid gland make T4 and T3. Now peripherally outside the thyroid gland T4 has to get converted to T3 and they use something called a deiodinase, just an enzyme that takes an iodine off of T4 and makes it T3. Now inside the thyroid gland, how you make those thyroid hormones, we use thyroid peroxidase and something called thyroglobulin. Okay, with that basic stuff, what this study looked at was, hey, it, there's a lot of different chemicals that we're, we become exposed to in this uh, in our world, right? Things that are used in foams and paints and cosmetics, you know, and, and cleaners. Is it possible for those chemicals to become immunogenic? Meaning, if they get in our body, is it, it could they cross react with T3? or other parts of the thyroid axis, meaning can the immune system start making antibodies for those chemicals, and then those antibodies might also attach to the things I just mentioned, like the TSH receptor, or the thyroglobulin, or the deiodinase. And what they looked at is something called human serum albumin. Right now, albumin is just a protein in our blood, but they, there's been some other studies that show that certain chemicals, if they combine with the human serum albumin, or HSA, that they become something that we call a neoantigen, a new thing that the immune system looks at and says, I don't know what that is, we better make some antibodies for it. Now there's a long list of chemicals in here, and I'm going to show you guys the, the graphics for it. But basically what they found is, yeah, there's a lot of common chemicals that are in our environment that you and I get exposed to that if they complex with our albumin in our blood, they can create a neoantigen that our immune system goes after, and the antibodies can, for that thing, for that chemical thing bound to the albumin, can stick on different parts of our thyroid axis, our thyroid circuit, and cause problems. Let me just jump in and show you what I'm talking about. All right, they looked at uh, TSH uh, receptors, right? And the two big things that seem to cross-react with that are aflatoxins. Now, aflatoxins are mycotoxins. They're mainly made by a mold called aspergillus. You can find that in a lot of foods like corn and rice and peanuts, uh, but you can also find it in water-damaged homes and buildings. Uh, I've seen a lot of cases of mycotoxin illness over the last few years, more than I ever thought I was going to see, you know, if you'd asked me 15 years ago. So aflatoxins, if they bind with human serum albumin, they can cross-react with TSH receptors, okay? The other thing that'll do that is something called isocyanate. Now, isocyanate is used in making foams and fibers and paints and varnishes and spray polyurethanes and building insulation materials. It's a very ubiquitous uh, sort of chemical. Now, if we look at the next thing, that we're looking at the deiodinase cross-reactor. Uh, aflatoxin, again, and formaldehyde, those can cross-react with deiodinase. So let's stop there. Why would it matter if you are cross-reacting with deiodinase? Well, because if you blow that up, then you can't convert T4 to T3, and you're going to function like you don't have enough T3, and you can get hypothyroid symptoms, which are things like depression and anxiety and weight gain and uh, constipation and joint and muscle pain and brain fog and hair loss, right? Okay, the next thing is thyroglobulin, which is that protein inside your thyroid gland that you can uh, use to make thyroid hormones. And again, our good friend aflatoxin is something that will definitely bind with that. Now, I will go ahead and tell you now that you can test for aflatoxins in two ways. You can do a urinary mycotoxin panel, which there's some caveats. I'm not going to go into that today. And you can also use a mycotoxin antibody panel. I'm not going to go into that today. I just want you to kind of understand that these chemicals, if they get in you, they can cause problems with your thyroid uh, function. Okay, so we move out of uh, the TSH receptor, or move out of deiodinase, move out of thyroglobulin. The next big thing is something that cross-reacts with T3, the actual T3 hormone. And again, aflatoxins will do that. Uh, the next one they found was formaldehyde again. Now, what is formaldehyde used in? Uh, you find it in the manufacture of plywood, paper, resins, glues. It's used in a, as a preservative in some things, antiseptics, some medicines. You see it in uh, different laboratories. Isocyanate, isocyanates again, which I just mentioned. 
Uh, now, there's something called 2,4-dinitrophenol. Now, here's what that does. That can elevate your basal metabolic rate, uh, lower your T4 concentrations, accelerates your per peripheral metabolism T4. That's all on its own. Like, if you get that stuff in you, it's very kind of thyrotoxic, but it can also bind, again, with your protein in your blood called albumin, and you can start making antibodies to it, and it can also affect and, and, and destroy your ability to make T3. Just your immune system goes after your own T3. Uh, the next was something called protein disulfide, disulfide isomerase. I'm going to skip over that. And then there's one called BPA or bisphenol A. Now, several years ago, this got a lot of attention uh, because it's found in a lot of things. Uh, they used it in plastic bottles. They used it as a liner in like some uh, canned foods, uh, bottle tops, water supply pipes. You see it in shatterproof windows, eyewears. I mean, it's, it's in so many different things. Now, what's interesting about BPA is BPA and T3, I'm going to show you pictures of it, they're so similar molecularly that BPA may act as a antagonist of T3, meaning it can bind to the place where T3 is supposed to bind, but since it's not T3, nothing happens. So high levels of BPA on its own can make you function like you don't have enough T3. But if you develop antibodies to BPA combined with your own albumin, that's a whole other mechanism where it can start to decrease your own levels of T3. Um, that's called cross-reactivity or molecular uh, mimicry. And we already know from other studies that have been done that BPA has a potential to induce Hashimoto's uh, all on its own. The next one is called tetrabromobisphenol A. That's basically a fire retardant compound. Uh, then there's mixed heavy metals they looked at. Now, what that is, I believe, was cobalt and arsenic and nickel and lead. Those cross-react with T3. And then there's mercury itself. Now, where do you get mercury from? Well, fossil fuels, eating fish like uh, swordfish and tuna and tilefish. Mercury is very, very uh, ubiquitous, meaning it's everywhere. And we all probably have some exposure to metals, but it depends on what our immune system does with those metals that really matters. That's why looking at metal antibodies can sometimes be a, a clue into whether or not someone's got a problem with those. Not necessarily looking at like your ability to excrete the metals. And again, that's another topic for another day. Let's get back to the list. Uh, parabens. Now, parabens are also everywhere. Parabens are almost very frequently used in cosmetics as a preservative, right? So if you're putting things on your face, I can, there, now of course they make things that don't have parabens in them, but parabens are very, very common in most cosmetics. And then the last thing that we know cross-reacts with T3 is TCE or trichloroethylene. That's a solvent that's used in industrial applications. It's also uh, used in dry cleaning or used to be used in dry cleaning. And there's lots of issues, uh, lots of cases reported around the United States where TCE has gotten into the water uh, and polluted the water, and it's a, it's a pretty nasty chemical. So what is the point of going over all those chemicals, right? I share that with you because it's another layer of what your person you're working with needs to know about what can make your thyroid symptoms uh, worse, what can bring on hypothyroidism, because yeah, Hashimoto's is the number one cause of, of hypothyroidism, but there are some cases that have hypothyroid symptoms that don't have TPO antibodies and thyroid globulin antibodies. Instead, they may have significant antibodies elevated to these things, and that could be a clue. And of course, the treatment in order to be work and be efficient has to be tailored to you and what's going on with you. So it's a little more advanced, a little more exotic kind of uh, reason for different thyroid symptoms and hypothyroidism. But the thing is, is these chemicals, which are found around us, and a lot of, we probably are all being exposed to them, they combine they can bind with a protein in your blood called albumin and create a neoantigen, which your immune system tries to go after, and it cross-react with these different pieces of your thyroid function. Your TSH receptors, your thyroxin deiodinase, your thyroglobulin, and your T3. That's a mouthful. I mean, I go back and watch it again if you need to kind of see, hey, where are these chemicals coming from? Do I know if I have exposure to these chemicals? Antibodies to most of these chemicals can be checked, uh, so you got to make sure you're working with someone that even knows about that. So. Just remember, with these chemicals, I know it seems kind of exotic, but if you have hypothyroid symptoms, like I mentioned earlier, and you don't have Hashimoto's, and your TSH doesn't seem to be out of whack, but you seem to really have depression, anxiety, hair loss, weight gain, you know, kind of the classic thyroid symptoms, I would make sure I was working with someone that can investigate this aspect of it and see if these aren't perhaps a hidden cause for why you have those low thyroid symptoms. I'll see you next time.